Welcome to Crime on Caffeine. I'm your host, Erica. And I'm your host, Allison. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode. Today, we be sipping on a local coffee for me. Um, super weird. So the other day, I was at the brewery having myself a little beer here and there. Um, and I'm looking, and I saw this little stand that said craft coffees. I was like, what the hell is this? So <laughs> <laughs> I was at Big Storm Brewing. Uh, in Tampa, and I got the after midnight coffee for myself. It's like a Havana chocolate molasses tobacco dark roast situation. And I, of course, texted Erica and I was like, Girly, they have coffee here. What do you want? <laughs> and of course, yeah. you picked the morning blend. <laughs> Shocker. A light Creature roast? of habit. No way. <laughs> but it did sound really good. I'm like debating on going back and getting it. It was caramel, chocolate, and I think citrus. Uh, mm, mm, mm. You can never go wrong with like a good morning breakfast blend, I feel like. You have to have it. You can't. And I feel like, honestly, a lot of the coffees I've been liking lately all have a, a common theme here. A citrus and a chocolate. <laughs> yeah, so true. I feel like that's everything that I have in my cabinet right now that we've been sent is citrus and chocolate. It is, but it's so good. So good. We're not mad about it at all. No, we're not. <laughs> and, you know, how how to Big Storm for not only having great beer, but having frigging great coffee. And I just saw on their um, website, I didn't even see this at the store or at the brewery, whatever the hell you call it, that they have like little nitro cold brews in cans and stuff. I saw that. It looks so good. I want to try it out. I know. Me too. And if they want yeah. to send me some beer on the side, that's fine. <laughs> we could do a drinking episode. I have some PBR hard coffee in my fridge right now. We should do that. Is it good? <laughs> This flavor was not my favorite. It's the salted caramel. I feel like a normal person would like it, but I it was just too sweet for me. I love the mocha one, and I love – I want to say I've had the mocha and the original, and they're both great. You know, one time I had um, – I think it's called Rebel. It was like a hard coffee. It was like a pumpkin spice latte. It was around Ooh. Halloween. Whew, that thing was good. That was dangerous. <laughs> so, uh, aren't they so dangerous? Because like, it, it tastes like straight coffee. Straight coffee. But let me tell you what, it was good as hell. Uh, thank you guys so much for 14,000 downloads. That's incredible. I can't believe we're coming up on a whole year pretty soon. That's oh, no. insane to think about. So thank you so much to everybody who has stuck with us through this wild ride. It's been so much fun and we love sharing these stories with you and bringing awareness to all of these important issues and cases. So we're glad that you like everything that we've put out and we've got some good ideas for the next year. So make sure you keep listening, keep subscribing, following everything so that you know when we have new episodes coming out. So what do you got for us today, Allison? I'm excited. Okay, so this is not a serial killer, and it is not – well, it kind of is a murder, but not, like, focused on that part. Okay. And it's not an unsolved case. Okay. It is the Lindbergh kidnapping. Oh, nice. I like it. This is a big one. It is a big one. And I guess I didn't realize how big it was until I started. It just like piqued my interest a little bit. And then I started researching and realized this was like a national situation. Yeah, yeah. It was huge. Big freaking deal. Um, but yeah, I guess I could just like talk about it now. <laughs> Charles Augustus Lindbergh Jr. was kidnapped around 
9 p.m. on March 1st, 1932 from his nursery on the second floor of the Lindbergh home in Hopewell, New Jersey. He was just shy of two years old, and he was the son of world-famous aviator Charles Lindbergh, and his wife was Anne Morrow Lindbergh. In 1927, he became the first person to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean without taking a single stop in a single-engine plane from New York to Paris. So he was basically an American hero. King shit. All right. That night when Charles Jr.'s nurse, Betty Gow, discovered he was missing at around 10 p.m., she immediately went downstairs where Mr. and Mrs. were relaxing to alert them. Everyone went on a frenzied search of the home and quickly discovered a ransom note on the windowsill of his little nursery. And the note was basically just demanding $50,000 uh, which in 1932 was a big old chunk of change. Uh, they notified the Hopewell police, who escalated it, the New Jersey police, to start an investigation. I tried to decipher what this note said, but the English was really horrible, honestly. Um, <laughs> the note said, Sir, have $50,000 ready $25,000 in $20 bills, $15,000 in $10 bills, and $10,000 in $5 bills. After two to four days, we'll inform you where to deliver the money, which they spelt money, M-O-N-Y, and they spelt ready, R-E-D-Y. <laughs> we warn you for making any ding, not anything, any ding, public or for notify the police the child is in good care so obviously this person is not either not from america or just not educated really because they spelled anything as any ding police was with an p-o-l-i-s-e and then instead of saying good care they said good like g-u-t <laughs> In it definitely place. sounds like someone European or it's yeah, that's what just I thought. giving BTK. It's it's giving not right. It's Incorrect. giving something all right. <laughs> it's giving no. <laughs> By the next day, word had gotten out about the kidnapping. Obviously, this drew in a big crowd of newspaper journalists and volunteers to the Lindbergh home. As you can imagine, this basically wrecked the crime scene and made collecting evidence nearly impossible. During the search, traces of mud were found on the floor of the nursery. Footprints were found under the window that were apparently impossible to measure. Two sections of the ladder had been used to reach the window. One of the sections was broken, indicating that someone was either going up or down and split it. There was no bloodstains in the nursery, nor any fingerprints. Later on in the investigation, there was also a thumb guard found at the entrance of the estate. Uh, the nurse, Betty Gao, believes that the baby was wearing it when he was captured, but that's literally all the evidence that we have to go off of. Wait, so why, sorry, why couldn't they measure the footprint? I could not find why they couldn't measure it. It just said, and this was from, I believe, the FBI's website saying that the footprint was nearly impossible to measure. So. <laughs> Source, trust me, bro. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sus. People who worked in the home and pretty much anywhere in the entire estate, for that matter, were questioned. Charles Lindbergh decided to ask his friends to help him communicate with the kidnappers to negotiate his son's release. Before any progress had been made with the failed leads for the first ransom note, a second ransom note was received on March 6th, 1932, just five short days after the kidnapping. The letter was demanding an increase for the ransom to go to $70,000 instead of $50,000. And then that's when they decided that they would hold a police conference after the conference, it was decided that private investigators would be hired to help solve the kidnapping. 
Before the private investigators could even begin to start their duties, a third ransom note was received on March 8th. It was addressed to Charles Lindbergh's attorney and informed him that a mediator appointed by the Lindberghs just would not be acceptable. And, of course, wanting to go more public with the case, the kidnapper requested a note in the newspaper. On the same day, Dr. John F. Condon, a retired school principal in the Bronx, published in the Bronx Home News and offered to act as a go-between and to pay an additional $1,000 ransom. So what a sweet angel man. (laughs) Out of the kindness of his heart, he wants to be the go-between. And give $1,000. Bless him. The next day, the fourth ransom note was sent to Dr. Condon, accepting the offer to be this said go-between for Charles Lindbergh and the kidnapper. Things started moving pretty quickly, and two days later on March 10th, Dr. Condon received $70,000 in cash as ransom and immediately started to do the negotiations for payment through the newspaper columns, using the code name, quote, Jeffsy, J-A-F-S-I-E. It's crazy to me that this is how this all went down. Uh-huh, because I feel like nowadays they would never do this, like negotiating. It reminds me of how the Zodiac had all of those, like, mm-hmm. I don't know, I just feel like all the codes and stuff that you have to crack for all that. Mm-mm. I'm not a code cracker, man. Or um, the one that we did the classified ads, Rapist. (gasps) Yes, I forgot about Mm -hmm. that. Oh, my God. Yeah. Don't. I'm not reading the newspaper. This is why nobody reads them anymore. They ruin newspapers. (laughs) This man single-handedly ruined the newspaper business in 1932. (laughs) How dare he? Okay. At... 8.30 8.30 p.m. on March 12th, after receiving an anonymous telephone call, Dr. Condon received the fifth ransom note, delivered by a taxi driver named Joseph Perone, who apparently received it from an unidentified stranger. The letter said hmm. that another note would be under a stone at a vacant stand 100 feet from a subway station. This note, which is the sixth ransom note at this point, gave more instructions on the tasks to do. So Dr. Condon, as instructed, met an unidentified man who called himself John at Woodlawn Cemetery near 233rd Street and Jerome Avenue. They discussed the payment of the ransom money, and then the stranger agreed to give a piece of clothing or something that would confirm the little boy's identity. He was given a baby's sleeping suit for identification, and a seventh ransom note came waltzing in on March 16th. Charles Lindbergh did confirm that the sleeping suit belonged to his son, and once that was confirmed, a eighth freaking ransom note was received. I didn't realize there were that many. Oh, yeah. Eight is not even, like, where we're going. We're we're on the train and we're still like, we got multiple stops. So now we have freaking eight ransom notes. This one was received on March 21st, insisting that the Lindberghs needed to comply completely with the demands and that this kidnapping had been planned for a whole year before it was carried out. So he means business. On March 30th, a ninth ransom note was received by Dr. Condon, threatening to increase the demand to $100,000 and refusing a code in the newspaper this time. The 10th ransom note received by Dr. Condon on April 1st instructed him to have the money ready the following night, to which he replied with an ad in the press. The 11th ransom note was delivered to Dr. Condon the very next day by, again, an unidentified taxi driver who said he received it from an unknown man. A lot of unknowns here. Yeah, I'd like pay pay more attention. <laughs> like, can you not give any sort of description? Give a sketch or something. What? Who are all these identified people? Dr. Condon found the 12th ransom note under a stone in front of a greenhouse in the Bronx. On the same evening, by following the instructions contained in the 12th note, Dr. Condon again met with whom he believed was John, this John character, 
to reduce the demand back to $50,000. This amount was handed to the stranger in exchange for a 13th note containing instructions on where the child could be found. It said he was on a boat named Nellie near Martha's Vineyard in Massachusetts. The following day, a search for the baby was made near Martha's Vineyard where they said that the baby would be, but it proved to be unsuccessful. The search was later repeated and still unsuccessful. Dr. Condon was positive that he would recognize John if he ever saw him again. So this at least was something good that we could go off of. They played them. They sure did. On May 12, 1932, the body of the kidnapped baby was accidentally found partially buried and badly decomposed about four and a half miles from the Lindbergh home. No. I know. A truck driver named William Allen was the one who found the body. The head was crushed. There was a hole in the skull and some of the limbs were missing. The body was identified and cremated in Trenton, New Jersey on May 13, 1932. The coroner's examination showed that the child had been dead for about two months and that the death was caused by a blow to the head. It's very sad, especially because they said that the child would not be harmed. Right. They said he was in good care. And he was not. I do wonder, like, when that happened. So, like, Mm -hmm. I don't really have information on the timeline for the baby. Yeah. I just want to know, like, when they decided to kill the baby or if that was always in their plan, you know? Yeah. Like, what was the final straw here? I don't know. That I don't have, which hurts. The New Jersey State Police Chief, Colonel H. Norman Schwarzkopf, wrote in a statement after the body was discovered, saying, It was as if some adult person had held the baby tightly in its arms and deliberately hammered the head with the purpose of causing instant death. No. So obviously, as I said before, I don't know if this was always in their plan to hurt the baby, but... It was clearly a violent crime. I'm wondering if they just, like, wanted to keep extending it and extending it so that they could get more money. But it's like they weren't about to take care of it for – it it takes so much to take care of a baby. Obviously, they weren't going to do that. Yeah, and part of me thinks that maybe when they decided to increase it to $100,000 because – it was first fifty, then it was seventy, then it was a hundred thousand dollars. I think maybe they just got impatient and weren't getting what they wanted, and were just frustrated in general, thinking, "Okay, well then we're not going to get anything from these people, so just mm-hmm. kill the child." Which yeah, is fucked in the head. Obviously, this case had a giant national following. There was a huge national interest in the case, and um, even the president, Hoover, and Roosevelt put a lot of priority on it, which led hundreds of citizens to bring in tips over. Literally, this is insane. Over 200 people confessed to the crime. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. None of their stories Why? held any. I I have no idea. I think just because of the sheer magnitude and, like, attention it was getting, people were like, I'm going to confess to this. People are nuts, man. I have no idea. But over 200 people confessed to the crime, and none of them were real <laughs> or held any statue. On May 10th, 1932, Violet Sharp, who was a waitress in the home of Miss Lindbergh's mom, was under investigation by the authorities but committed suicide by swallowing poison when she was about to be re-questioned. Oh. Yes. At first, when I read that, I was like, well, that's that's suspicious. Uh-huh. But apparently her whereabouts and the alibi that she had on the night of March 1st had been carefully checked, and it was ruled out that she had no connection to the abduction. Hmm, even if she wasn't there physically, though. Hey, 
I'm with you. I thought that was real sketch and that they just kind of brushed that one over. Yeah, because that's a very... It's a very serious thing to do right before you're re-questioned. You mm -hmm. just commit suicide by poison? Yeah, by poison too. Like, that's a, a lot. Yeah. Yeah, was well, a lot. On January 17th, 1934, a letter was issued to the New York City Bureau Office for all of the banks in New York City requesting that an extremely close watch be made for those ransom bills. There were pamphlets handed out that contained serial numbers of the ransom bills, and the New York City Bureau distributed copies of those pamphlets basically to anywhere money was exchanged. So people handling money in banks, clearing houses, grocery stores, gas filling stations, airports, department stores, post office, like everywhere. Everybody had these pamphlets. And so anybody who handled money knew exactly what the serial numbers were on all of the bills that were handed over to this said John. In all, there were literally thousands of leads in all sections of the United States that were followed. The results of all of these investigations, no matter how small, how big, were reported to the Bureau. The activities of the known and suspected members of the so-called Purple Gang in Detroit and various rumors about allegations concerning them were followed. Nothing came Who of that. Who are they? The Purple Gang? Mm -hmm. Hey, if you gotta ask, you don't know. I don't know. <laughs> If you gotta ask, you ain't down with the purple gang. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Actually, I'm just saying that because I have no fucking clue who the purple gang was. But hey, they, well, uh, they, they were in Detroit, and people suspected they asses. Oh, they um a criminal mob of bootleggers. Yeah, that's them. <laughs> Um, they disintegrated during the 1970s and early 1980s, and they were absorbed into the current 116th Street crew. <gasps> if you're curious if they're still around, they're they are. They're just here. in a different gang. Okay, so the Purple Gang is now the 116th crew? Something like that, yeah. But right. they are the Detroit's most notorious organized crime gang in the 20s and 30s. Damn. Well, I'm sorry to tell you, but they had nothing to do with this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they, they thought, though. They did check out that boat as well, the Nelly boat that the person said the baby was on. There were numerous registries of the boat, and nothing came of that. There were also a lot of records of cemetery employees pulled because Dr. Condon did meet this so-called John in a cemetery at one point, and nothing came of that either. I'm just telling you all of the things that happened that nothing came of it from. <laughs> I'm giving you a lot of dead ends here. Information from various other kidnappings and extortion cases handled by the FBI were examined in close detail to study particular references to the Lindbergh case. Obviously, they had hundreds of photos and descriptive data that they have in their database for criminals and any kind of possible suspects that they could look at to hopefully get an identity for this mysterious John that keeps coming up. And on May 2nd in 1933, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York discovered 296 $10 gold certificates and one $20 gold certificate. All of these had Lindbergh ransom serial numbers. These bills were included among the currency received at the Federal Reserve Bank on May 1st, 1933, and apparently had been made in one deposit. Despite extensive investigation, the depositor of these was never located. Uh, there was an address found on there, but again, they could not find who had actually deposited the money, which is so crazy to me. 
again, I know it's 1932 or 1933 at this point, but but still, you would think that there would be something. If somebody deposited 296 of these ransom bills and there was an address, there's nothing to go off of. You can't find this person yeah. at all. So that, I feel like, is just like a big oop, you know? Examination of the ransom notes handwriting was evaluated by experts, resulting in a unanimous opinion that all of the notes were written by the same person and that the writer was of German nationality. That's what I was thinking. That's what I'm saying. With all that misspelling and, like, the way they were saying things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But this person probably did spend some time in America, Dr. Condon described John, the so-called John, as Scandinavian and, and believed he could identify the man. He even spent a lot of time just viewing all the photographs of possible suspects that um, the FBI had given him. Another interesting attempt to identify the kidnapper centered around the ladder that was used to get into the little boy's room. Police quickly realized that it was not built right. The letter had been thoroughly examined for fingerprints, and they even had parts of the ladder analyzed for like types of wood used to make the ladder. Um, they wanted a complete examination of the ladder by itself by a wood expert because they thought that they could get additional clues from that. Um, and in the early 1930s, an expert on could be found from the Forest Service, from the United States Department of Agriculture. So they found Arthur Kohler. He disassembled the ladder and identified the types of wood used to create it. He also looked at the pattern made by nail holes. And he summarized his findings in a report that later played a very critical role in the trial of the kidnapper. Yes, we get into the good stuff. We're getting there slowly but surely. This is so wild. Is it? I feel like I'm... it's just. I wonder if this thing, if this exact case, like happened this time, if it would have gone on this far. I'm trying to think or... of any kind of quote American hero out there that. If their son was taken, the world would just, like, be set on fire like this. I feel like any kind of, I mean, not that people would be set on fire for, like, government officials, but, like, a high profile, I just feel like it would never have gotten to, like, this many ransom notes or, like, I mean, they would have seen who deposited the money. Like, it would never have gone this far. Yeah, I think it is a case of the time, too. I mean, it was only the 30s, so you have to think about... A hundred years ago, right? Close. We're getting there. That's crazy. I know. For a second, I thought that, like, that was wrong, and I was about to be really embarrassed with, like, that. (laughs) But no, that's true. Yeah, no. That was a long time ago. And now we have CTV, like, all this Mm -hmm. stuff, fingerprinting, advanced fingerprinting, might I add. But I do wonder if we do have the uh, the ladder examiners as they it, did. That I, nobody's as into <laughs> wood as they were back there. Somebody back find the ladder examiner. Starting on August 20th, 1934, and extending into September, a total of 16 gold certificates were discovered. Most of them were in Yorkville and Harlem. As each of these bills were recovered, they were putting the locations on like one of those pin boards. So they would just mark the location of where these bills were being discovered so that they could track the movements of the individual or individuals who might be passing the money. It always reminds me of that meme from, I want to say it's always sunny. And, of Charlie. Um, yeah. <laughs> and he's like all cracked out. He was like huffing spray paint in that episode, I think. And he's like... <laughs> that that's exactly what was happening for the first time in the history of the case the investigators succeeded in finding uh the description of the individual passing the bills and Let's it go. exactly fit 
this so-called John that Dr. Condon had been describing. So it was determined through the investigation of the bills being passed that this, this was our dude. On September 15th, 1934, an alert attendant at a gas station received a bill in payment for five gallons of gas. And he said the man fit the description and was being suspicious. So he recorded the bill, obviously, and the license plate on the person's car. The license number was issued to Bruno Richard Hauptmann. And the address that was given was 1279 East 222nd Street in the Bronx. Hauptmann's house was closely surveilled by federal and local authorities throughout the night on September 18, 1934, until at approximately 9 o'clock in the morning on the 19th, an individual closely fitting the description of John left the house. John has exited the building. John has left the building, and then he entered his automobile parked nearby and he was taken into custody by representatives. So that's good. Hell yeah. We did it. We've got John. <laughs> well, his name is not John. Well, yeah, what the hell is his name? <laughs> Bruno. We don't talk about Bruno. <laughs> Actually, have you seen that? Encanto? No, I haven't yet. I haven't yet. It's good. It's a good it's one. It's good? Okay, okay. In that movie, they don't talk about Bruno, but we are going to talk about Bruno. So after some investigating, he was found to be Bruno Richard Hauptmann, a German carpenter who, which I found so funny. I'm like, a German carpenter? Really? We got a wood expert, a carpenter. Mm -hmm. They had, were on the right track. <laughs> <laughs> they should have just had this guy come out and examine the ladder. <laughs> He's like, yes, I broke. Anyway, he was a German carpenter who had been in the country for about 11 years. He had a $20 gold certificate on his person. So obviously this was one of the ransom bills and they were like, okay, I think we're on the right track here. His description fit perfectly of the John person that we've talked about for, you know, like the last 30, 40 minutes. And in his house, they found a pair of shoes that had been purchased with the $20 ransom bill. All that for some shoes? <laughs> no. no, that was just his first purchase. He actually admitted to several other purchases that had been made with the ransom certificates. On the night of September 19th, he was positively identified by Joseph Perone, who was the cab driver in one of the handoffs of 80,000 ransom notes. And then the following day, they found $13,000 worth of the ransom certificates in a secret place in the garage at Bruno's home. So there you have it. There's your friggin' evidence. They also discovered that he was in possession of a Dodge sedan automobile, which somebody said was seen in the vicinity of the Lindbergh home the day prior to the kidnapping. So we are connecting the dots here. Shortly after his apprehension, they took samples of his handwriting and flew them to Washington, D.C. to have them studied by the laboratory. A comparison of the writing samples from the ransom notes and his were closely similar. They said, end quote, it was remarkable similarities in inconspicuous personal characteristics and writing habits, which resulted in a positive identification by the handwriting experts. So basically they were exact. <laughs> a lot of words to say they were exact. Further investigation revealed that Bruno was 35 years old and he was a native of, again, Saxony, Germany. He had a criminal record for robbery and had spent time in prison. Bruno successfully entered the United States in November of 23 on the George Washington. On October 10th, 1925, he was married to a New York City waitress named Anna Schoeffler. He had a son named Manifred, who was born in 1933. 
Funny enough, the day of the kidnapping, Bruno had changed his occupation from being a carpenter to trading uh, rather extensively in stocks. So I'm seeing that he decided to go the money route. And that's when he decided, you know, I'm going to get money a different way. I'm going to steal a kid and get money from rich people. I literally hate that he called it trading. Yes. Began to trade rather extensively in stocks. Bruno Hauptman was indicted in the Supreme Court in New York on charges of extortion on September 26, 1934, and on October 8, 1934, in Hunterdon County, New Jersey. He was indicted for murder. Two days later, the governor of the state of New York honored the requisition of the governor of the state of New Jersey for the surrender of Bruno Richard Hauptman. He was removed to the Hunterdon County Jail to await trial. A record 700 reporters were in Flemington, New Jersey at the start of the trial in 1935. Wow. I know. The trial... I'm surprised that they were even, like, allowing media... Um, well, they were outside, so they weren't inside. Oh, okay. About 700 reporters were inside. I was like, uh. That'd be a very crowded trial. Quite a bit. The trial began on January 3rd, 1935, and lasted five weeks. The case against him was based on circumstantial evidence, obviously. Um, tool marks on the ladder matched tools owned by Bruno. Wood in the ladder was also found to match wood used as flooring in his attic. Dr. Condon's telephone number and address were found scrawled on a door frame inside a closet at his home. And the handwriting on the ransom note matched samples of his handwriting that were um, looked at by the FBI. So there was a good amount of evidence, but it was all non-DNA evidence. Not looking good for him. <laughs> no, it's not looking great, no. On February 13th, 1935, the jury returned with a verdict. Bruno Hauptman was guilty of murder in the first degree. His sentence would be death. But on April 3rd, 1936, at 8.47 p.m., Bruno Richard Hauptman was electrocuted. He never confessed to the crimes and questions about whether he actually kidnapped and killed the little Lindbergh baby are still questionable to this day. Some experts suggest that at the very least, he didn't act alone in committing the crime, which yeah. is very possible. I definitely think that he did not act alone as well. Yeah, I really want to know what the, the mother's waitress was involved in this. Why she would have committed suicide. Mm-hmm. I just feel like, obviously, I don't really have a psychological profile for this man, but I did. I did a little bit of psychology of kidnapping because we've never done that before. Yeah. Kidnappers tend to develop a profile of their likely target before making an abduction based on their overall goals, which usually falls into one of three categories financial gain, extremism, or emotional disturbance. Obviously, from one of the ransom notes, we knew that this was planned for over a year, and it was for financial gain. So there we have it. If a kidnapper is going to take a hostage for ransom, he will target the victim based upon an outward appearance of wealth or information given to him from someone who knows the victim, such as a household employee, a bank teller, a waitress, um, or somebody who knows the person intimately. So I thought this was interesting because <clears throat> there was a waitress that was somehow involved, but she had committed suicide the day before she was re-questioned. And I'm mm -hmm. not saying she was involved, but she might have been involved. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I'm in the game clue. <laughs> It was the waitress in the dining room with a lead pipe. <laughs> anyway, and then the last little bit I have on kidnapping. There's a strong emotion and mental defect, 
also that play a large part in overall number of kidnappings. The kidnapping of a child by a non-custodial parent or adult is usually based upon the emotion the kidnapper feels that the child's welfare and best interests are at risk or that the child will be gone completely from their lives. A non-custodial parent kidnapping also can occur out of spite or revenge. Um, People take hostages during periods of rage and profound loss, too. I wanted to add this because part of me thinks that this whole plan was derived from a man who clearly was not doing well in his life. Um, He was trying to get to America multiple times and it wasn't really working out for him. Um, He was not making a whole lot of money. I think he was just mad at the world and... When he started doing stocks, it was probably very hard for him. He realized he wasn't going to make the money he thought he would in America. So he decided to, you know, choose somebody that was of higher power and create a kidnapping. And that's just my opinion. You said he had a kid, right? He did. He had a wife and a kid. Yeah, that's the most upsetting part. The fact that, like, he killed him. And he has a kid. Yeah, I thought about that because where did he, when they were checking his house and stuff, they didn't mention anything about his wife and child. So I don't Mm -hmm. know if there was, you know, they were clearly not living with him. I don't think his wife and kid are like, oh, who's this baby you've just come in contact with? And why are you all of a sudden getting $50,000, $50,000, like... Right, right. So, he was living a double life, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm thinking that there was... They didn't have anything to do with it, or they didn't know anything about it. But yeah, that was my case. Amazing. Great pick. Oh, and shout out to um, my adopts guy, Joe, because I told oh. him... I know, he's going to listen to our podcast on the way <gasps> to his hike. Thank you, Joe. I hope you're doing well. I miss everybody over at H&L so much. Yes, we miss you too. Come back. (laughs) But he was like, I'm going on a hike in a national park, so if you could give me some recommendations, uh, hopefully none that actually have to do with national parks. Oh, no. I'm scared to do national parks cases. I fell onto some TikToks the other day that reminded me of how everyone should just avoid national parks at all times. You tell Joe that. (laughs) But yeah, that's all we have today. Thank you guys so much. I'm so excited that we are over 14,000 downloads and our anniversary is coming up in May. So we want to do something big for that. And hopefully we can reach at least 15,000 downloads by then. I I have faith in you guys. Um, But also thank you for being patient during our like week-long uh vacation from the podcast that was very nice of you guys um we got a lot of like really supportive messages so that was really nice thank you um but we're back and we're better than ever and we're ready to keep it up we are i have a huge unsolved case coming for you guys next week so this one Mm. we're gonna put our thinking caps on and it's gonna be one of those ones that angers you fuck yeah, so get ready. Excuse my vulgar language, but fuck, man. <laughs> I hate that. It, and Luna is pulling my hair, so I'm taking that as my cue to give her some attention. So yeah. thank you guys so much for listening. <laughs> and thank you again for all of your support during just this timeline. I know it's been different, but thanks for sticking with us. We're going to go back to our normal Wednesday episode, so yeah. stay tuned and... We'll talk to you guys next week. Yeah. Catch you on the next one.